So good afternoon, everybody. Um, we have a special guest today who I will let introduce himself to you, but uh, the Venerable Hung Shur is a 40-some year Mahayana Chan monastic teacher, practitioner uh, from Toledo, home visiting his sister. Uh, and so we were lucky enough to uh, be able to invite the Venerable, and he was gracious enough to uh, be willing to come and connect with us all, and I'm just delighted for the opportunity. Uh, please give the Dharma your full attention. give you a line and you give it back to me. Namo tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed Noble, Noble and perfectly enlightened one. And perfectly enlightened one. Listen carefully. Namo Sadanto. Namo Sadanto. Reverend Rinson, Reverend Doan, Dharma friends, family, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted. My name is Hung Shur uh, of Toledo, Ohio, by golly. Um, I cherish the opportunity to, to sit here in the Buddhist temple of, of Toledo, and bright light in northern, northern Ohio, and uh, to come in the midst of your session. Things I would like to say I hope will be helpful to the practice and won't disrupt you and have to know that we, we scaled it way back. I left the guitar in the car and I turned the computer off. So it's just my mouth to your ears and the 17 people who are watching online. <laughs> Uh, we're going to, let's see here, we're going to go 45 minutes, roughly, thereabouts. 
if, if anybody has a question or something comes to mind you'd like to, to explore further or correct me, uh, and I would be thrilled if you would, um, please don't hesitate. Uh, the, the goal is to communicate, however that's done. So let me give you just a little bit of biographical background so you have a sense of, of uh, the kind of the roads that I've walked. And ideally, there could be some overlap or some connection with the roads you're currently walking. And let, let's see how they, how they intersect. So I was uh, born in Columbus and raised a Methodist. Uh, discovered, uh, I was at Epworth. Epworth Methodist, just around the corner here. Uh, at one point, the, when I started asking those important questions, you know, I realized that the answers that were coming to me from Sunday school were uh, geographically and culturally located, and it wasn't my tribe. I didn't relate to the the sand and the camels and the palm trees and the dates and the burnt offerings. And, and the, we had a, a wonderful uh, minister, Methodist minister, a series of them actually, who uh, when I told him that I wasn't connecting, uh, he didn't threaten the spiritual violence, he didn't send me to hell, he didn't, you know. He said, well, keep looking, son. So I went on Central Avenue to the Sigmund Sanger branch of the Toledo Public Library, by golly. And there on the Eastern religion shelf were three books. One was Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. Anybody remember? I'm, I'm dating my son, some of you, good. Boom, you do, see, <laughs> deep roots. As the bow loves the arrow that is swift, so does the arrow love the bow that is stable on parents, right? Parenting and children. So Khalil Gibran, that was, a, that was available wisdom. You could grab it. Uh, brilliant Lebanese writer. Put that one back, and the next book on the shelf was the Dao Dao Jing, the Lao Tzu, the founding book of Taoism. And it was a special volume because it was bilingual. Chinese on one page, English on the other. And so I was in the category called searching. I was just really searching. And so here is the, the Dao Da Jing, and I could see the characters here, and I would look across to the English and match them up and excited because this was exotic and foreign and deep and profound. So it said, Dao Ke Dao, Fei Chang Dao, Ming Ke Ming, Fei Chang Ming, Yong Ming, Tian Di Zhi Shi, Wu Ming, Wan Wu Zhi Mu. The Dao that you can name is not the eternal Dao. The name that you can name is not the ultimate name. When you name it, it's the beginning, Tian Di Zhi Shi, the beginning of heaven and earth. Nameless, it's the progenitor of all of creation. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> my tribe, that's where I belong. And it's like, whoa, and it just went on. So I took the, the talk, I, I took some of the Dao Da Jing back to Sunday school. <laughs> and the Sunday school teacher was the father of one of my classmates. You know, the parents, long-suffering parents stood in to, to be the Sunday school teachers. And I said, uh, Mr. the it was Mr. Alley, Raymond Alley was his name. I said, Mr. Alley, uh, it says here that uh, the Tao is the spirit of the eternal feminine. It's the absence, it's the emptiness that provides its use and its function. Could you explain that? <laughs> he says, son, you can't, ask, you can't ask that question here, he says. So I said, I have to go somewhere where I can ask that question. And, you know, that's not fair. That's not part of Christian theology, you know. So, so I walked away, and with the blessing of, the, of the, uh, the minister, Pastor Paul Trove. And uh, 
went back to the Sigmund Sanger Public Library, and by golly, the third book on the shelf was The Six Patriarchs Dharma Jewel Platform Sutra, published by St. John's University Press, bilingual, Chinese English facing. And I would read Six Patriarchs Sutra. I was 15 years old, and here I was reading a Mahayana text in Toledo. I had this uncanny sense that I had been speaking to the Six Patriarchs that morning the voice was happening inside me. It was as if I just hung up the phone with the Sixth Patriarch. And I said, that's, that's what I'm looking for. And people say, well, how did you become a Buddhist? And my answer, short answer is the Chinese language. Devobus High School was one of the three high schools in America that in 1965 started the, 1964, the Sino-Soviet Studies Institute. A man named John Campbell, who had been a Green Beret in Taiwan, special forces, had fallen in love with Chinese culture. And he determined that he was going to make it available to folks in his hometown, Toledo. So he did. He got a, I think it was an NDFL Title III federal grant to start an institute in Devilbus servicing all of Toledo high schools with Chinese language, Russian language, Chinese history, and Russian history, four courses. I was ready for another language class. I was there on time. I enrolled. I thought my folks were going to say, what in the world would you want to waste an elective for that? They didn't. They said, please, it'll broaden you. This is good for you. So I ran into Chinese as a junior in high school. You know. Now, uh, some 56 years later, I'm still studying Chinese every single day. So that was the road that led me step by step. So I uh, went to Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, studying Chinese. And one of my professors was a man named Thomas Fitzsimmons. Tom Fitzsimmons was a beat poet. Uh, hung out in the village with you know, Gregory Corso and Gary Snyder and Allen Ginsberg and Philip Hoyland. And so Tom Fitzsimmons said, um, you should move your Chinese forward. Oberlin College had a summer semester in Taiwan. So I applied, enrolled, went to Donghai University in Taiwan in 1969 to study Chinese. So Tom Fitzsimmons says, oh, we're going to Taiwan. It says, you'll be passing through San Francisco. Go see Gary Snyder. Ask him what's going on in Kyoto. So I said, can I do that? You know, he says, here, here's his address. I knocked on Gary Snyder's door on Clay Street in San Francisco. Gary Snyder says, oh, you're going to, uh, you're going to Kyoto, right? Uh, uh, apparently, you know. <laughs> So he said, go find Ermgard Schlegel in Daitokuji. She's kind, of the, she's kind of Zen central in Kyoto at that time. So I did. The Oberlin trip came back home. I went on by myself to, to Kyoto, age 19, never been out of America, and found a ryokan to stay on my own and spent three days with the futon over my head, just trembling, you know. <laughs> I don't speak Japanese. So I uh, went to find her in Barsh Lake. She says, Daitokuji doesn't take Westerners. There's too much trouble. Antaiji does. Go see Uchiyama Roshi. So I did. Uchiyama said, Yurashai Masaya. He said, Nihongo ga do jōzō desu ka? I said, I'm sorry, I don't. He said, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, stayed with in the house that Dick Baker had just vacated and came back to San Francisco. So that's my Zen credentials. That's my story. Check off the boxes. Right? <laughs> so came back, finished, uh, finished my senior year in Michigan. And my roommate had since gone to San Francisco and met uh, Master Shren Hua at Gold Mountain Monastery in the Mission District in San Francisco. So this is the the 
the entire banquet of Chinese Mahayana uh, practices and all. So I uh, enrolled at UC Berkeley for a degree in Oriental languages and met Master Hua and decided that uh, I wasn't going to be an academic, I was going to be a monk. So that's just the long and short. Um, so that was, I took refuge in 1973, became a Buddhist, took my three, three mandalas of precepts in 1976, became a bhikshu. So that was, since then I've been uh, following the Avatamsaka Sutra. Uh, the Chinese call it the Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yin Jing. The Japanese call it the Kei Gong Kyo. So, uh, I never thought that I would be devoting half of my life to one book, but that's the case. I followed the Avatamsaka Sutra. I did a pilgrimage at one point um, in my formation as a young monk. It started in South Pasadena, in Los Angeles, and started with another monk, two of us taking three steps, bowing to the ground, and reciting a verse of repentance from the Avatamsaka Sutra. For all the harmful things I've done with my body, speech, and mind, from beginningless greed, anger, and stupidity, through lifetimes without number, to this very day, I now repent and I vow to change entirely. And then stood up, and then three more steps, bowed to the ground, recited the verse. On the way down, I recited Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Huai Yin Jing which is, I return and rely on the Buddha's expanded teachings of the Flower Garland Sutra, bowed and stood up, and the ocean-wide Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So every bow, that's the whole process. So three steps, Namo Buddha, Namo Dharma, Namo Sangha, Namo Dafang Guangfo Huai Yin Jing, recite the verse, Huai Yin Hai Hui Fo Pusa, three more steps. So we started in South Pasadena, and two and a half years later, we finished in Ukiah, California, Mendocino County, covered 800 miles up the Pacific Coast Highway, and uh, kind of bowed through America's backyard on the edge of civilization, as far as our manifest destiny pushed us westward. That's where we couldn't go any further. The Pacific Ocean stopped us. But um, during that time, I was silent. I didn't talk for six years. I kept a vow of silence, which I, I, I kept. And uh, because my, I've learned that my own personal uh, issues have to do with telling the truth or not telling the truth. Ex exaggerating, adding salt and vinegar, Irish roots, you know, adding the blarney, a touch of the blarney, you know. So just to make it a better story. Was it true? Oh, who cares? It's a better story, you know. So. so it was the six years of silence started to peel back the layers of, you know, this tendency to want to put myself in a better light, never mind the truth, you know. So, and that will trip one up in cultivation. So, my, my name and Dharma, master, my teacher, Master Shen Hua, gave me the Dharma name Guo Zhen, the fruition of the truth. And then when I took my final vows, it was hung shi, constantly real. So true and real. And the day in 73, when I took refuge, I saw my name on my refuge certificate. It's like, wow, Guo Zhen, that's great, the fruition of truth, because I, a lot of truth, right? No, it's because you lie too much, he said. <laughs> Bunk. <laughs> like, Nobody had ever said that looking not at my eyes, but at my soul, you know, and it's like, <gasps> so I had, we see ourselves in the mirror the way we're, we want to be, you know, not the way we are. So anyway, um, so it's been, for me, the, the, the process of cultivation after all these years is tuning in to when I stretch the truth and trying hard to, to uh, catch that bad habit. All right, so that's, that's enough about me. The, um, here we are, sitting. Uh, you have a really vigorous schedule. Your daily schedule is, is the real deal. You're really sitting and coming face-to-face -face with, with your mind. And uh, 
what I wanted to uh, share, I think I might be useful, is to put a little context around that and from what, how I'm understanding it these days. And I, to, to be fair, I want to identify myself in the wider Buddhist community, which is to say, you know, the prince, Siddhartha, wakes up under the Bodhi tree, and his teachings went down to Sri Lanka early, and then across to this, called the Southern Tradition, to Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, Laos, Theravada, still very much alive in the world, the, the monastic tradition. And they went from India, again, east, to China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Mahayana. So Theravada, Mahayana. They went north, Nepal, Tibet, to... By, you, you're fully in the Tibetan lineage here, but the, uh, my friends call me, they, they, the Lama Zopar Vache, they call themselves Tibetan Mahayana, not Vajrayana, which I didn't know. Vajrayana is a, one part of Tibetan Mahayana, the way they call it. So then we have Theravada, the elders, southern tradition, Mahayana, and we're, we're striking Hinayana from our vocabulary, pejorative, right? Smaller vehicle. I just took part in an ordination at, uh, actually four days ago, at, at Abayagiri Forest Monastery in Redwood Valley, Ajahn Chah's Thai forest tradition. Those monks are all over six feet tall. And I go, you're the smaller vehicle, you know, you're just a small vehicle. And they go, oh, and that makes you the greater vehicle? Is that how you, you know? So it's like, that's not useful, that's not helpful. So Southern tradition, Northern tradition, Theravada Mahayana. So all of those representatives are now global. We're now in the West. And, Buddhist temple of Toledo, my goodness, you know, brilliant place. So my having Zen, Soto Zen roots from Eheji, from uh, Uchiyama was the, the, the teacher at Antaiji, and uh, his teacher was Sawaki Kodo Roshi. So they go right back to straight line to Eheji and Dogen. So there's that. And then in the Chinese Buddhist world, if you think of yogas, how many yogas are, are there now? We've got Hatha yoga, which is downward facing dog. We have Raja yoga, which is a meditation, more meditative, silent. There's bhakti yoga, devotion, chanting praise. Hare Krishna is a bhakti yoga style. There's jnana yoga, study of wisdom and knowledge. There's karma yoga, service and deeds. There's kundalini, which is a kind of an internal, you know, alchemical. There's soccer mom yoga. That's our new American version, right? And... Uh, each of those yogas serves different natures, different people, different phases of your life. Maybe some of you have multiple yoga trainings or practices. Likewise, in the Chinese Mahayana, there is Chan school, which Chan, as people know, is the Chinese that became Zen, but Chan came from Dhyana. So we have Dhyana, which divides into Shamatha, and Vipassana. The Chinese call it zhi, stopping, calming, guan, and contemplating. So that's dhyana. The Chinese couldn't say dia. They didn't have that phoneme. There was no dh consonant cluster. So they said chan, chan no. Originally, they shortened that to chan. The Japanese heard that and said zen. So what is chan, zen, is watching the mind, various techniques in that. I'm sure you're, each of you is working with those, your choice of techniques. There's also, so that would be the jnana yoga or the, the um, raja yoga, 
different stillness and contemplating. That when you go to, to East Asia, the most popular form of Mahayana practice now is devotion, reciting the Buddha's name, bhakti. In the yoga structure, it would be bhakti yoga. Devotion, opening your heart to the beloved or the, the, the divinity that you're losing yourself to. The most popular by far, by far, is Amitabha, the Buddha of limitless light. In, in the Japanese world, that's Jodo Shinshu, right? Amitayus, nam namidab, nam namidab, nam namidab. Jodo Shinshu, the oldest institutional Buddhist entity in America is, this will be on the quiz, so I won't take note. Who? Anybody know? And when? Which was it? Bingo, five points. Well done. And the date? No. 1898, in San Francisco, Buddhist Churches of America, the Buddhist, San Francisco Buddhist Temple, first one. Master Xuan Hua came in 1962 and created the first monastic sangha, first five Americans took the, took the precepts, left home, shaved their heads, became monastics in 1969. So that's devotion. And it's a very different use of the mind. It's as if it's a yoga, zazen, sitting, you know, we say chan uh, chan in Chinese is zazen in Japanese, is absolute non-reliance, no conditions are going to help me wake up. Uh, bhakti, devotion, is so different because you say, I'm going to recite the name of the Buddha of limitless light, Namo Amitabha, Namo Amitofo in Chinese. And uh, truly, uh, it, has, it is the most popular form of, of Buddhist practice in Asia. In Taiwan, for example, uh, it is, the, this devotional practice has penetrated Taiwanese society so thoroughly that you don't have to be a Buddhist, but you, you see somebody in the, in the, in the walk and you say, huh? Amitofo, Amitofo, hello, right? So pick up the phone, ring, Amitofo, hello. How do you say goodbye? <laughs> Amitofo, 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 Amitofo. <laughs> goodbye, right? Something scares you, you go, oh, me too. you know, son of a gun, or wow, you know. Uh, and, and, if you watch any Chinese martial arts film, you always know the villain. He'll be in a Buddhist robes with beads that could choke a horse, you know, the beads that are like, He's usually got a whisk in his hand. He's got those eyebrows, you know, big eyebrows. And what does he say? He says, ah, me, ha, 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 you know. He's the villain. He'll be dead before Act Three. So the righteous Kung Fu master will dispatch him, you know. So thoroughly penetrate. That's devotion. That's bhakti. Okay. So there's two. There's Chan and Pure Land. And... Why is it so popular? Because we say, this is the, the Pure Land's response to Chan, right? They critique Chan and say, if a hundred people meditate, maybe one might gain liberation from suffering. Whereas, a hundred people recite the Buddha's name, a hundred people can be reborn in Amitabha's land of utmost happiness, Sukhavati the place where suffering is over. Now, interestingly enough, why is it so popular? It's wrong to say it's easy. It's not that it's easier, because to really recite the Buddha's name is not an easy thing to do, to keep that focus. But you don't have to be flexible. You don't have to be able to sit in zazen, you know. Uh, and you can do it. It's portable. It's a portable practice. You don't need a Zafu and a Zabaton, you don't need the, the bell and uh, the incense. You can recite it while driving, 
You can recite it before sleep. You can recite the Buddha's name when you're sick. You can recite the Buddha's name all day long. And in our tradition, we have folks who do 10,000 names, 100,000 names a day. At the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, uh, we were, during COVID, we were, we put our practices online, as, as many communities did. And we have our elder monk, Jinfo, our master Jinfo, twice a day, he's online, reciting the Buddha's name into the camera, and there are 90 people around the world reciting with him every day reliably, you know. So you can all rush back to YouTube and check it out. So, so with Master Jinfo, he's, he's a great old grandfatherly monk. He's really good. So that's two. Third is Mantrayana. Mahayana spends, has as a big piece of its practice mantras. And I know through the Japanese tradition you have the same. And these, uh, for example, we're up at four in the morning. First thing we do every morning is recite the Sharangama mantra. Fifteen minutes, one mantra. We just recited a piece of it. We went, Namo Sadanto, Suche Doye, Ola Hadi, Samya Sampadoshya. That's a piece of the Sharangama mantra, the start of it. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened. So that, that's followed by what are called, is the great compassion mantra, Maha Karuna Dharani, and then the ten small mantras, followed by the Heart Sutra, which you all do in your, your style. And every day. So the mantrayana is um, not as popular because you have to learn the mantras. In Japan, it became the Shingon, Shingon Kyo, right? Uh, that's three. Number four is the Vinaya school, which is to say, for celibate monastics, we've got the uh, the Vinaya rules. And if you look at the Tripitaka, the Buddha's canon, there's three por- tri- Tripitaka, three baskets, sutras, shastras, Vinaya. So sutras, words of the Buddha, shastras, commentary on those words. And the Vinaya is the Buddha's rules for organizing the community. How do you make new monks and nuns? How do you discipline monks and nuns? What do you do when it's time to go alms rounds? How do you uh, pass on lineage? How do you uh, determine authority within the cetera? You know, community rules. So there are people who love that study. They would probably be Buddhist lawyers, I suspect, would be the ones who would warm up to the Vinaya. It is, tends to be a little dry, you know. But uh, either that or you're a Virgo, right? Virgos go for you know. Not necessarily. Some, some Virgos. All right. Finally, one more. These are called the five schools. Chan, Pure Land, Mantrayana, the Vinaya school, and the last one is, Chinese is called the Jiao Zong, and it means the teaching school, the school that focuses on what the Buddha said, words the Buddha spoke. And the, it's, to say it's academic, yeah, more so than Chan, which tends to, to set print aside. But the teaching school, Master Xuanhua, my teacher in religion, um, came to America. He said one of the great virtues of Christianity is how they have put a Bible into every hotel room in every hotel in the world in the local language, Gideon Bible, right? How wonderful. You're in Spain, you open up Gideon Bible in Espanol, and you go to France, and it's French. So he said, how many hotels do you go to, and you open the drawer, and you find the Diamond Sutra? Why not? Why not? These sutras are wonderful. The Lotus Sutra, the Sharangama Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Amitabha Sutra, the Urstor Bodhisattva Sutra, the Medicine Master Sutra. Founts of wisdom. These, it's a mirror for your true face. You look into the sutra and you see yourself before your habits and preferences. 
You look into a sutra and you see the map back to your, your original mind. You look in the sutra and you see the blueprint for building the house of wisdom that you aspire to, to accumulate, right? And yet, if you don't speak Chinese or Korean or Japanese, they're basically silent or Tibetan. So he said, time to translate those sutras. He spoke Mandarin, came to America, enlisted the next generation to help him translate. Suddenly, my education in Chinese was useful. Ah, I think I can contribute. You know. so, so every night for 30 years in America and Canada and wherever Master Hua was, he at, we did evening chanting, 6.30 to 7.30. 7.30 opened up the sutra that he was explaining and got a translator, one of us sitting there, and he would, 10 minutes of explanation, doing exegesis, right? Doing, if you're Jewish, it's midrash, right? Doing midrash on the text. And saying, help me translate. And we'd turn off the Sony reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, roll it back, to watching the counter, you know, and then press the button. And sure if it was sad, da 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 punk. Oh, he's, that, what I think he said was, you know, it was Chinese after all, you know. <laughs> And it's Buddha Dharma, which was often, you know, uh, requires real stillness to understand. So, and then we would reach the end, record him again. So after 30 years, we have this body of wisdom for the West. Because the audience, we're sitting in a converted mattress factory in the Mission District in San Francisco, freezing, called Gold Mountain Monastery. And... Master Hua was interpreting the Buddha's words for the West. And that's the teaching school. And it's a long line of monks and nuns who said, let's find out if the Buddha speaks English. Sure enough. However, boy, I'll tell you, what a process. At first, you know, the, I, I got there in 70, 72, and became a monk in 76. And uh, with that, uh, the break for my pilgrimage, came back and continued the speaking again, continued the translation. At first, our ability to understand the Chinese was really limited. We grew listening to his Manchurian accent. It was very pure Mandarin. And our knowledge of Dharma was, you know, a thimble, a teaspoon, you know. And yet, as we listened, there seemed to be this rarefied wind blowing through Gold Mountain where suddenly doors opened. You could, it made sense. And it wasn't opaque. And it wasn't foreign. It was speaking from inside. And of course, the process was we were removing the coverings of our mind, which is the work of cultivation, you're all doing it right this minute, in this week, in this lifetime. So bit by bit, it started to clear up. But then translation is, is a, it's a, it's real gong fu. You know, you get, it's, you're working with streams of consciousness and knowledge and custom and, and uh, linguistic uh, paradigms and, you know, convention and stuff. Um, slang comes into perfect example, perfect example. There's a phrase called, uh, uh, so, miao fa, ah, wondrous dharma. And at one point, people were, how do you translate the miao? Miao is wonderful, exotic, marvelous, special, all these words. And uh, one of our, our frontline translators, a man named David Rounds, came in one day, our regular scheduled translation gathering. He said, oh man, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, we sure can't use the word awesome anymore. <laughs> he said, why not, David? He says, I was just at the, uh, the Black Oak Coffee Roasters and the barista asked me for my order. I said, uh, soy latte. He said, awesome. He said, we just can't use that anymore. It's awesome has just lost its awesomeness. You know? 
So, yeah, so words come and go. So the early translations that we did were largely in Chinglish. <laughs> Chinese word order with English words pasted on top. And the Buddha did not speak some metta language, some, you know, uh, halfway in between. The Buddha spoke deva. The Buddha spoke bird. The Buddha spoke ghost. You know, the Buddha was, a, they say, for yi yi yin er shuo fa, zhong sheng sui lei ge de jie. The Buddha speaks the Dharma with a single sound. Living beings interpret it each according to their own abilities, right? So for us to translate the Buddha's words into some sort of metta language was a disservice. We are now officially going back and redoing that next step, which is how do Americans really speak? How do Canadians really speak English? How do, you know, South Africans and Aussies really speak English? So it's a long, long practice. And certainly someone will come behind us who will improve on our version. So that's the, you'll notice of the five schools, I've done the teaching school last because that's to my utter amazement, I found myself uh, connected to answering, helping answer the question, does the Buddha speak English? I had no idea. When I started, like everyone else, I read the Three Pillars of Zen, Philip Kaplow, and I read Alan Watts, The Way of Zen, and I read D.T. Suzuki's, you know, Zen practice and all, and I wanted to get enlightened, you know, as the late great Houston Smith, the professor of religion, said, I was whoring after enlightenment, you know. <laughs> I would sell anything to get enlightened. And had no idea, you know. Enlightenment seemed like you could get a six-pack of it at, at Costco and, you know, <laughs> maybe trade it back in if it wasn't satisfactory, you know. Get a better one. I want the giant economy enlightenment, you know. And because why? I was raised to be a consumer. Growing up in Toledo, I would watch the, De I was a Detroit Tigers fan. And we had Harvey Keene, right fielder, certain age, okay. So what, was, what did we hear listening to Ernie Harwell report the Tigers games? We heard, brush up, brush up, brush up, get the new Ipano with the brand new flavor. It's dandy for your teeth, right? Bucky Beaver. See the USA in your Chevrolet. America is asking you to call. Why am I polluting your ears with this stuff? Because my very first session at Antaiji, 19 years old, my knees were on fire. I never sat longer than half an hour, and they did hour sits at Antaiji. And Kinhin in a Buddha hall so small that your foot, you did half a, half a foot's length, Kinhin, then half a foot. If you took a full step, you'd bump into the person in front of you. So uh, sitting there in, it was the northern part of Kyoto, and there was one bus that took you up, Kitako, Suginawa, Kitako, Kentaku, Omiya Dori desu, Suginawa, Omiya desu, said the recording on the Japanese bus, telling you what stop was next. We were sitting in the zendo at Antaiji, and the bus is coming up the hill, Kitako, Kentaku, Omiya desu, like, here comes the bus, you know. That means only 30 minutes left, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we faced the wall. And you can see your, there's one bare naked light bulb in the ceiling, so your shadow is here. Sitting there thinking, am I enlightened yet? <laughs> <laughs> I might be. <laughs> and then, from in the stillness, See the USA in your sh Right? Where'd that come from? So I mentioned that my, my bad habit was to... Uh, we're, we're almost out of time here. My bad habit was to, to never tell a story without salt and vinegar, right? I was in theater in high school. And uh, I uh, memorized Broadway musicals. Damn Yankees. West Side Story, 
My Fair Lady, The Fantastics, right? Uh, Camelot, uh, and then perform those roles. Little did I know that the mind is like your sensor on your camera. Your mind, the mind is like film. Whatever you put in front of your eyes and ears and nose is yours. Camelot, Camelot, I know it gives a person pause, but in Camelot, those are the legal. <gasps> Who's doing that? <gasps> All these tapes roll back one after the other. It took four days to get me through Peter, Paul, and Mary, the Kingston Trio, the Chad Mitchell Trio, Ian and Sylvia, Judy Collins, Joan Baez, Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, Phil Oakes, who knew that that's what I had exposed to my senses. I had it all. It was playing back because in, during a, an hour of Zazen, your senses are relatively quiet, right? So you're not feeding across the sixth consciousness into the alaya, into the the storehouse consciousness, and so it feeds back. Same thing as dreams, happens in dreams as well. It seeds in the alaya, the storehouse consciousness, coming back across the seventh into the sixth consciousness awareness while you're asleep or while you're sitting. So all is playing back. I didn't realize that I had absorbed beer commercials. Blatt's beer tastes great wherever you go. Smoother and fresher, less filling, that's clear. Blatz is Milwaukee's finest beer, right? I'm like, I thought I was meditating. I thought I was, you know, is this supposed to be happening? Obviously, it is. And birth and death ends the same way. You know that the story goes that the prince, as he became the Buddha, still had three karmic debts to repay as the Buddha, the story goes. Those seeds that we plant are really ours. So the teaching is plant carefully grasshopper, right? Because whatever we plant, for good or for ill, of this I will be the heir, right? So how humbling to realize that you have to get into the trenches with the real, uh, the reality of your six senses. Have you protected them well? Have you guarded your six senses? And the answer is, nope, you know. So welcome to the process of purifying. It's ongoing, probably lifetimes, to clean it all out. So what do you do? You practice patience. Patience. Okay, uh, we're, I have one, one more story. I wish we had more time. Um, I mentioned... Master Empty Cloud, who lived to be 120 years old, born in the 19th century, um, passed on in 1959. He was, he's my, the grand teacher of the disciples of Master Hua. So uh, Master Empty Cloud um, also did a three steps, one bow pilgrimage from Putoshan in the East China Sea all the way to uh, Mount Wutai in far off Shanxi province, 3,000 Chinese miles, about 1,000 US miles, um, and still didn't wake up. But his famous enlightenment uh, happened at a place called Gaomin Monastery, which was famous for having very long incense, 90-minute uh, incense, and you didn't, you didn't dare move. You know? So, uh, I'll, I'll shorten the story. Uh, if we, next time I'm back, I'll tell you the whole story, and it's worth, worth hearing. But he, uh, he wound up at uh, Gaumin Monastery for a 10-week birth and death Chan retreat, a session. And he had been sick, and uh, his resistance was very low, which means his False thinking was relatively less than usual. So the, um, it was into the, the fifth week of his meditation. 
And uh, they had a practice at night, the last sit, the 11 o'clock, 11 to midnight sit, the last incense of the session. Um, monks keep tea leaves in the bottom of their teacup, and they send a verger around with boiling water. And monasteries in China are, were, in many cases still are, pretty primitive. So they heated the, the hot water over a big iron kettle, you know, the, heated by wood. And the, so there's lots of, you know, soot on the outside of this iron kettle. And they give, the verger is usually some, you know, the youngest monk. And so he had a big cloth to keep his hand from being burned. And he goes down the row, and the monks hold out their cups, and he pours water in. Well, he slopped the water over the cup and burned the hand of Master Empty Cloud. Dropped his teacup, and it went on the spot. He woke up. And his previous 56 years of effort came to fruition at that moment. And the tradition in China is when you wake up, you have to write a poem. It's required. So he wrote two, two poems. It goes, uh, Beizi pu lo di, xiang sheng ming li li, shu kong feng sui ye, kuang xin dang xia xi ye. The cup hit the floor with a ringing sound and echoed in the air. Empty space, too, broke to bits, and my mad mind stopped right there. That's the first one. Tang zhi shou, da cui bei, jia po ren wang, yu nan kai, chun dao hua xiang chu chu xiu, shan he da di shi ru lai. Burned my hand, busted my cup, broken for good my mind. Like my family, it's lost. People are gone. Words are hard to find. Spring is here. The flowers breathe their fragrance to the sun. Mountains, rivers, the earth itself are just the thus come one. So if you look at those, so the first, the, the, the first poem is just those four lines, but the second one is eight lines. And he says, burn my hand, shattered my cup, broken for good my mind. Like my family, it's lost. People are gone. Words are hard to find. So the idea is when consciousness turns to wisdom, it's really empty. And emptiness does not play favorites. There's no sympathy for you, for me and my habits and my faults and my preferences, right? It's empty. The void is cold. Nothing. And it leaves you with that feeling. It's bracing, for sure. But, wow. Kind of get lonely for, for a hug, you know. However, that's called true emptiness. But the Mahayana, but the Buddha's wisdom, arises from compassion. They say, Jun kong bu ai miao yo. True emptiness does not obstruct wonderful existence. Wonderful existence doesn't obstruct true emptiness. They are not two. Spring is here. The flowers breathe their fragrance to the sun. Mountains, rivers, the earth itself. It's just the, the thus come one. It's just the Buddha. So in the midst of that emptiness, it's all back. It's all a gift. Without effort, the flowers come back on their own. So to hear these two poems, one looking dead on into the void, saying, nothing. And then in the midst of that, oh, look at that. Raphael Warnock won. So yeah, it's a gift. So that's the, the poetry of a, a truly awakened Zen master. Then he went on, at age 56, that was the first half of his life, right? Went on to the other half and walked and talked in China and around the world. So. All right, uh, 
Thank you so much for your attention. And may your efforts as you go through the door of Zazen and the practices that you're, you're discovering, it's every step takes you deeper into your heart. And I, uh, for, for a decade, I taught Buddhist Christian dialogue at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. And one of the conclusions that I, one of the things that appeals to me the most about Buddhism is that 90% of the world's religions have a theos, have a divinity, have a god, theology, theos. He's up, he or she is up there, out there, you know. And somehow the idea that you at one point hope to replace God in the firmament up there, blasphemy, you don't, you know, like there's a gulf between you, there's a chasm. Buddhism, among world's religions, doesn't do that. We are not atheistic. We are not polytheistic. We are non-theistic, which is to say we don't, this, our story, all religions start with a story. Our story does not include this divine, powerful being. Instead, Buddhism says, turn it around. Here's where you look. And no matter how you, what, how you start on your search for the Dharma, the promise is, depending on your vigor, your patience, your virtue, your kindness, you will replace the teacher. You'll become the Buddha. All living beings have the Buddha nature and all can become Buddhas. It's only because of false thoughts and attachments that we don't know that. So I, among other world religions, that's quite a message, isn't it? That you will keep walking and replace the founder. That appeals to my bone-deep democratic nature as an American, you know, <laughs> so I like that. So if uh, I had one more thing to add, I'd like to dedicate merit, if we could. I know you have a closing, but uh, so I would invite all of you, each in your own way, to make a wish. And in Judaism, we call it tikkun olam, repairing the world. It's only by good wishes that it happens. So make that wish, however you'd like to share your goodness. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving, unity. May our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. I'll give you a line, you give it back. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Amen. Yes.
Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll be moving into extended outdoor kin hen. Um, Hoshi, I ask you to lead that. Uh, I'd like to see the clergy back in the ancestor room, please. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> 